My name is Bruce Griffin. I'm professor of ancient scripture at Kaiser University in San Marcos, Nicaragua. And we're going to be talking about the readings that will be at Mass this Sunday, the 23rd of April, 2023. I want to begin by thanking my good friend, Professor Walter Kruger, who's encouraged me to put some reflections on camera for all of us as we prepare to worship Jesus Christ in the Eucharist this Sunday. Three readings are going to be what we're looking at. We have Acts chapter 2, where Peter on the day of Pentecost is preaching to the people of Jerusalem. We have 1 Peter chapter 1, where Peter is sending a letter to the area of what would now be modern day Turkey. He is sending this from Rome to evangelize and to confirm the believers there in the truth of the faith of Jesus Christ. And then finally, we will be looking at a resurrection story from St. Luke in Luke chapter 24, where here Luke will be talking about Peter's witness to the resurrection and the power of our personal experience of the resurrection in the Eucharist, which we celebrate every Sunday. Let's begin with Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up with the eleven and addressed the crowd in a loud voice. Now let's have a couple of things clear in our minds at this point. Peter is a young man. We often think of Peter as being old, 50s, 60s, portrayed with a gray beard and things like that. But the average age to follow a rabbi at the time of Jesus Christ was quite young. Josephus, we know, began following rabbis when he was 15. So when we think of Peter, we should be thinking of a young man, uh, probably uh, college age, the age of my university students. We need to think of the apostles as a team of young men, similar to uh, maybe the guys on, on my basketball team but they've left everything that they have to follow Jesus Christ. The second thing that is worth pointing out here at the beginning is the cultural clash that is built into Peter's preaching here. Peter is from Galilee, and so are the rest of the apostles. And they highlight the fact that they are following, in Peter's words, Jesus the Nazarene. There are, Jesus is just the Greek form of Joshua. There are lots of Joshuas in ancient Israel. What is crucial here is that he's from Nazareth, a town so small it would even be smaller than our town here of San Marcos in Nicaragua. And you have in this case typically clashes between rural groups, small, isolated, and then the major capitals, which are powerful, wealthy, they think of themselves as the natural rulers of their countries. And in this you have a built-in conflict between the small outlying rural areas and the ruling capital cities. And Jesus and Peter, they've got the wrong accent. You can tell in many countries as soon as somebody comes into a major capital from the accent by which they're speaking the language. And this is Peter. Peter is speaking in a Galilean accent as was Jesus. And right there, that's enough to turn off the people that he's trying to listen to and to communicate with in Jerusalem because he's not part of the ruling elite. You will notice else you will notice also something important that's going on here, which is that the Holy Spirit has come down on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus, when the apostles are praying at 9 a.m. in the morning. There were set hours of prayer that the ancient Jews had that corresponded to the time of praying or the time of the sacrifices in the temple. There was the nine o'clock in the morning prayer, there was the noon prayer, there was the afternoon prayer, and the Gospels are all careful to point out that Jesus was crucified at the time of afternoon prayer with the afternoon sacrifice being made in the temple. What we have here is a team of men, of apostles, who have lives committed to prayer. What we're going to see in Acts chapter 2 is the power of the Holy Spirit coming down in flames of fire 
enabling the apostles to speak in other tongues and peter is going to give a message that is going to convert thousands of people in jerusalem we make a mistake if we see this as being something personal to peter as though it's peter's own power his own gift his own personal excellence and holiness what's happening here is the outgrowth of an entire team of people praying for peter peter later in the book of acts will be rescued when he is asleep in prison and when he's sleeping and perhaps should be praying the house of john mark is praying for peter and god is going to send an angel to liberate him so when we think of our pope when we think of him, when Pope Francis became Pope, the first thing he asked was, you pray for me. And this is our responsibility. The Pope needs us to pray for him, to pray the Our Father for him, to pray the Hail Mary for him, and to pray the Liturgy of the Hours for him, which is part of the tradition of the Church. I want to say, if I can, I would be grateful for the prayers of all of those who watch this and see this, and if this is any blessing to you, I would be deeply grateful for your prayers as we talk about the Word of God, the Bible, and its meaning for us today. I should add uh, that uh, now on your cell phones, you can get uh, the Liturgy of the Hours on applications, which can help remind us to pray the Liturgy of the Hours as we go through, as we go through our day. Now, Peter declares to the people of Jerusalem, Jesus of Nazareth was commended to you by God by miracles and signs and wonders. But, but, after he was executed, God raised him from the dead. And then he goes and he quotes from Psalm 16, one of the Psalms of David. I saw the Lord always before me. At my right hand, nothing can shake me. My heart is glad, my tongue cries out for joy, my body will rest in hope, you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to experience corruption. And that is a fascinating line, and look at what Peter does with this. He goes, brothers, no one can deny that the patriarch David himself is dead and buried, his tomb is still with us, but because he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn him on an oath to make one of his descendants succeed him on the throne. What he foresaw and spoke about was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the one, the Christ is the one, Jesus of Nazareth is the one who was not abandoned to Hades and whose body did not experience corruption. We see here the transformed way in which the apostles will now start to read the Old Testament. They will read it Christologically. They will read this as being focused on Jesus Christ himself. And Peter, in 1 Peter, will talk about how the prophets and the apostles of the Old Testament, it was revealed to them that they were witnessing not to themselves, but to us. Now that's shocking, and modern biblical scholarship has huge problems with an idea like that. But Peter is convinced that the writings of the apostles are Christological, they are focused on Jesus Christ, and they are meant to minister, certainly in part, to the, to the people of their own time, but to us, to us in the church. And I'm an ancient historian. I use what is sometimes called the historical critical method. This is most of what I do. I work with ancient papyri. And yet the Word of God, as written in the Bible, cannot be limited to what we can understand using the historical critical method. Right here, Peter says that beyond what we can interpret, we understand that the ancient writings, the ancient prophecies, point towards Jesus Christ, and they point towards our time. Now, Peter will then develop this in his message in 1 Peter chapter 1. It's really not clear when exactly Peter wrote this. Uh, many biblical scholars think it was written actually after Peter's death in Peter's name. I think that it is more convincing to see this as being written by Peter himself, but the exact date when he would have done it is not clear. 
perhaps as early as the fifty's maybe in the sixty's maybe right after the jewish war had started but you'll notice this peter goes remember the ransom that was paid to free you from the worthless way of life of your fathers you were redeemed not by silver nor gold but in the precious blood of the lamb and that lamb jesus christ was raised from the dead so that we can have faith and we can have hope. the message that peter is driving home is that as a witness to the resurrection as somebody who saw the resurrected christ as somebody who preached the resurrected christ on the day of pentecost this redemption frees us from the notion that what we're doing in this world is fundamentally focused on this world. On the contrary, it is focused on the next world where, as Peter puts it, everyone will be judged according to their works. We are often focused on how much money we make. My students are here at Kaiser University in part because they're hoping to make money. And it is certainly the case that all of us have to make a living one way or another. Those of us who are professional academics are frequently focused on honors, doctorates, where we teach, whether we're full professors or not, whether we've won awards for our scholarship or our teaching. And Peter says, that's all worthless. What matters is our faith, our hope, our love, what we've shared and given to those around us, how we've looked after the poor, and when we meet God and when we are judged according to our works, we will not be judged according to our honors. We will not be judged according to our salary. We will be judged for our love, our faith, and how we share with those around us. A powerful message in a country like Nicaragua, and indeed like the world, where so much of the world, and even so much of the Christian church, is polarized between the rich and the poor, between the wealthy and the destitute, between those who have some types of blessing and those who don't. And Peter left everything to follow Jesus Christ, and he is encouraging us not to be focused on silver or gold, but on the precious blood of the Lamb, and in that, to share with those who desperately need our help and our assistance. Now this theme of the resurrection, which Peter preaches in our first text, text from Acts, which he references here in 1 Peter 1, is then developed in a rather remarkable way in Luke chapter 24, written by St. Luke, uh, the great German scholar Adolf Harnack, showed how this was written probably around the year 62. Luke uh, is remembered as a medical doctor and one who, in his words, followed all of the apostles from the very beginning. And this is a remarkable story. It tells the story of two witnesses to the resurrection. One of them is a man by the name of Cleopas, who, according to Pegasippus and other ancient sources within the early church, uh, Cleopas was a brother of Joseph, the husband of Mary. His wife, uh, Mary, was one of the women who went first to the empty tomb, and there is reason to believe that Cleopas had a son, uh, Simeon, who ultimately became Bishop of Jerusalem, uh, at some point uh, after the death of Jesus and in the first century AD, we're not told the name of the other witness. And some in the early church thought that the other witness was St. Luke himself. Luke doesn't say that, but he doesn't rule it out either. And often when I read this, I, I think that this is probably in fact St. Luke. But notice here this story. Jesus was executed on a Friday, on a Sunday morning, they have heard the stories of the resurrection from the dead. They are walking from Jerusalem to a village called Emmaus. And we're not exactly certain the location of this village. It appears to be north and west of Jerusalem. Uh, and the two of them seem to have been going there 
and as they are walking on the road jesus comes up to them and they don't recognize him and cleopas tells him you must be the only person in jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened and jesus goes what's happened and cleopas goes jesus of nazareth a great prophet in word and deed he was crucified but we had hoped that he was the one to set israel free and you need to understand that jesus's crucifixion was not just a tragedy in the eyes of the overwhelming number of jews in the period it proved that he was a fake it proved that he was a fraud it proved that his claims to being a messiah were phony if you were the christ you didn't get crucified and if you got crucified you weren't the christ their idea was was that the christ the messiah will liberate us from the romans in the same way that moses liberated the jews from pharaoh in the same way that the maccabeans who had launched a revolution approximately 200 years before the death of jesus had liberated the jews from the greeks they were looking for this type of a liberator and when jesus christ died on the cross it proved that he was a fake a fraud a phony and that his mission had failed and it is so in response to this that jesus then tells them oh fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken wasn't it necessary necessary for the messiah to die and then be risen from the dead and hence to enter into his glory and then it goes on to say that beginning with moses and with all the prophets he explained to them the passages throughout the scriptures that were concerning himself I would give anything to be there and to hear Jesus explain it, the prophecies of the Old Testament that point towards the resurrection and the crucifixion. We know what one of them was because Peter mentions this in the passage that we just read. It's Psalm 16 that refers to the Messiah being raised from the dead. And the Messiah can't be raised from the dead unless he first dies. We also have another text later in the book of Acts in Acts chapter 3, where Peter talks about how in Deuteronomy 18, Moses pointed out that God will raise up for you a prophet like me. And the word raise up in Greek is the same word as resurrection. So here we have Moses and David offering texts that point towards a Messiah who will die, but who will then be resurrected from the dead. And this is astonishing to Cleopas and the other disciple as Jesus explains this to him. And they don't recognize him and who he is. Now look at what happens next. Jesus is gonna go on to another village and Cleopas and the other disciple go, no, 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 stay with us. And so they sat down at table and Jesus takes the bread and he blesses it. And the word in Greek for blessing is Eucharistine, which is the root of our word for the Eucharist. And when he Eucharistines the bread, they suddenly realize that it's Jesus. And when they realize that it's Jesus, he's gone. And they sit there shocked, and they realize they now have to go back to Jerusalem and tell the apostles that they have seen the resurrected Jesus. So they return to Jerusalem and the apostles are there and they're going it's true Jesus has been resurrected from the dead Simon Peter has seen him now one of the great mysteries of the Gospels of the New Testament is why we never have any detailed report of what exactly Peter saw when he saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. We know according to the Gospel of Luke that he went to the empty tomb and saw the grave clothes. John repeats this story, but neither Luke nor John tells the story of Peter's encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Now Luke, in the book of Acts, is gonna tell three times, three times, the exact details 
of paul's encounter with the resurrected christ on the road to damascus but he tells us zero times none the details of the resurrection encounter that peter had on that sunday but look at what he does they tell the apostles we saw jesus in the red in the breaking of the bread why is luke doing this because he wants us to know that we are not going to be like peter we are not personally going to have an encounter with the resurrected christ but the resurrected jesus is present in the eucharist under the appearance of the bread and the wine if we are looking for proof of the resurrection if we want to know how jesus christ was resurrected from the dead if we want to be with him if we want to touch him if we want to communicate with him we can do that at any point when we go to the eucharistic host when we go to the bread when we go to the wine and there in the bread and wine is the resurrected christ this basic principle is going to be picked up later in Irenaeus, who was a student of Polycarp, who in turn was a student of the Apostle John. And John was the one who went with Peter to the empty tomb Easter Sunday morning and saw the resurrected Christ. And the great line of Irenaeus, and this is included in the Catechism in section 1327. The Eucharist is what we believe, and our faith in turn is confirmed by the Eucharist. The Eucharist is central to our proof of the resurrection from the dead. This is what in theology is known lex, as lex orandi, lex credendi. That is to say, as we pray, so we believe, as we believe, so we pray. And without this, Catholic worship would not be the same. I'm an ancient historian. I'm a biblical scholar. I walk into a classroom and I talk to students about the biblical texts, the biblical manuscripts, and what they mean. But I can't change anything. I can't do miracles. I can't raise Jesus from the dead. But every priest ordained through apostolic succession who celebrates the Eucharist, who recites the words of institution, turns the bread and the wine into the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. Where this is not there, where you have different forms of Christianity that don't accept transubstantiation, or to use another word that the Eastern Orthodox would use, that the Eucharist is the true body and blood of Jesus Christ, then, then the church is just a lecture hall. The church is just an academic classroom. We come, we talk about the Bible, but nothing necessarily really changes. But in the Apostles' Creed, we confess, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, and in the Eucharist, God the Holy Spirit comes down in the bread and the wine and transforms that into the body and blood of Christ. And so we are called, all of us, to give praise and to thanks and honor to Jesus Christ present in that Eucharist. And as Mother Teresa of Calcutta put it, we are called to meet Jesus in the distressing disguise of the poor. As we learn to see Jesus in the, distress, in the distressing disguise of the Eucharist, of the bread and wine, we can learn to see Jesus in the poor, and as we learn to see Jesus in the poor, we can learn to see Jesus in the Eucharist. This is our calling, this is our mission, this is who we are meant to be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.